Since I've been at Notre Dame, a lot of things have changed, obviously, in the world, and the department has changed a lot as well. We still have a lot of these uh, strengths in these traditional chemical engineering areas, but they've really grown and evolved in response to a lot of the societal needs that, that we see now. In particular, our reaction engineering and catalysis fields are really now focused on sustainable energy, which is much more of an important problem now than I would say it was 20 or 30 years ago. In the area of fluid mechanics, we're doing a lot more in uh, nano and micro fluidic type devices for medical diagnostics, uh, those types of applications, whereas usually we were thinking about large scale flows in pipes, now we're thinking about flows in nanometer sized channels that can develop uh, diagnostic tools, uh, laboratory on a chip type devices, those types of things. And then of course the whole revolution in molecular biology has, has approached our department as well, and so we're applying a lot of chemical engineering fundamentals to look at uh, human health and uh, therapeutic development. The department is adding faculty in a number of core areas, I'd say, in the department where we have strengths and where we're looking to build strengths. And catalysis has historically been a, a real strength for Notre Dame, and it continues to be a strong area. Uh, Tom Degnan and Jason Hicks have really combined, I think, to, to build one of the uh, world-class uh, research groups in catalysis, thinking about biomass conversion as well as zeolite catalysis. In conjunction with Bill Schneider's computational work, I think they really have kind of set the standard for how you build a, a, a really strong um, catalysis research group. So my research group is interested in the use of, of simulations, computer models, to study chemical reactions. And we apply, we apply those tools in a number of different domains. Probably the one that's most significant, most uh, familiar to people is in the area of, of what's called um, heterogeneous catalysis. Our picture of how a catalytic material works, the model that's sort of developed over time, is sort of a static one in which you have a, a solid material, molecules come and land, and bonds are made and broken and then materials go away. But what we're discovering is that that static picture is really not complete, that these materials and this chemistry is really quite a dynamic process. So it's not enough to just take snapshots of what's going on. You really need to see the movie. A very exciting thing that's going on in catalysis is, is that my experimental colleagues are developing, acquiring the techniques that allow them to capture the dynamics of these catalytic transformations in the laboratory at the same time that our computational tools are able to do the same thing, to start to give us those movies rather than those uh, snapshots. Things that I'm really looking forward to over the next five years or so is seeing this evolution of the field into a more um, a dynamic picture of what's going on at the molecular scale. And not only that dynamic picture, but closing the loop, how we take that dynamic information and really uh, use it to learn how to tune systems to make them behave the way that we want them to behave. We have very strong programs in, in both uh, energy sustainability and in, in looking at water. Um, so developing new materials is one of the key areas for that whether it be in, in terms of solar cells, in terms of electrochemical energy storage, in terms of, say, membranes for water purification. All of those areas, I think, are really going to be key, and we have core groups of people working on those areas together. My research generally focuses on liquid phase separations using polymeric membranes, and so they, they have a variety of uses, whether it's biopharmaceutical purification, water purification, or energy-related separations. Um, we find a way to design these materials and make them for these different applications. We work on a variety of different types of membranes, but behind most of them, uh, we use a, a technique or a technology known as self-assembled block polymers. And, and what's really nice about the membranes made from these materials compared to the state-of-the-art technology is that we have a, a very fine control over the, the pore size and the pore density in these membranes. Because these pores are templated by the self-assembly of the block polymer, their size is very well defined, um, and we can control that size, which I think is another unique advantage that we have. Um, because the self-assembly of the block polymer material controls the pore size, we can control the synthesis of the block polymer, and by controlling the molecular weight of the block polymer template, uh, 
actually affect and change uh, in a rational manner the ultimate pore size of the membrane. So we can change it between about 2 and 50 nanometers at this point in time. But we have the, the material advantage of having a more well-defined pore size distribution, but we also have the advantage of being able to tailor that pore size to sieve out particular uh, solutes from the solution. And so going forward, one could imagine trying to fractionate different nanoparticles or different uh, sized entities uh, using these membranes. Uh, and so that's something that current membranes aren't capable of doing. I think one of the things that we have that's unique is we not only have demonstrated an ability to control the nanostructure over large dimensions and tailor the pore size, but we, we've kind of taken a step out with some collaborators from Purdue University and, and now we can tailor the chemical nature of these pores. And so you can imagine using a, a different type of separation, one not based off of size, but based off of chemical interaction. We initially began developing these technologies for water treatment and water purification, but through the collaborative atmosphere at Notre Dame, we're starting to branch out and look at other applications for these chemically tailored block polymer membranes. Well, one interesting thing is something that began very recently. Uh, Professor Bashar Bilasher from the College of Engineering and his students are very interested in ways to purify monoclonal antibodies and other biopharmaceutical products, and they have a, a whole library of exciting ligands that are capable of selectively binding these uh, therapeutic molecules and recently we've begun to look at how we can anchor these molecules in some of our membranes in hopes of purifying them more cost effectively so that they can reach the general population and uh, patients and clinics. The interesting thing for me right is right now we're focused on just scaling it up but once we've understood how to scale it up then we'll have these large sheets of membranes that have these interesting properties which no one has quite understood yet. So we work in a collaboration with people at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and MIT on um, a joint center for energy research. So this is a, an initiative and it's headquartered at Argonne National Lab. And what we're trying to do is develop um, new electrolytes for batteries. The Schaefer Research Group studies fundamental questions relating to ion transport and reaction at electrode interfaces. We need to overcome the safety failures of lithium ion batteries if they are to be used on a large widespread scale, say a mass use in electric vehicles. One of the research questions that my group is very interested in is how do we create polymeric electrolytes with high ionic conductivity. Thus far, we know how to make both ceramics and liquids that are very highly conductive. And so these materials can be used in a battery that provides high charge and discharge rates. Currently, we can't do this with polymers, at least at ambient temperatures. So polymeric electrolytes, when they're used today, have to be used at elevated temperatures, often 90 degrees Celsius. A good goal for uh, an electric vehicle is to operate in an intermediate temperature range, such as 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and improvements have been made in this area. But going even further, if we would like to use very safe lithium ion batteries, even in our electronic devices, that would require them to have high ionic conductivity at room temperature or even lower temperatures. So in order to do this, we must understand a lot more about the ion transport mechanism. In addition to safety, reductions in battery cost are required to make electric vehicles affordable for the average consumer. And even cheaper batteries with long lifetimes are needed to store energy from solar cells and wind turbines so that we can have renewable energy when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. Our, our faculty care a lot about uh, fundamental research. Um, at the same time, the department is, is very much interested in, in working on problems that have a direct impact on humanity. There's a real commitment by the university um, to invest in, in uh, research, to try to advance uh, the different departments, and to provide the kind of support that we can bring in the very best faculty, the very best graduate students, the very best postdocs, very best undergraduates, and come together and solve some of these problems. And it's really kind of an exciting time that the resources and the vision are here that will really enable us to, to achieve some of these things. And as a researcher, this is the kind of place you want to be.